The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. All that was super crystal clear, right? Oh. <laughs> you all know it was written, so we can just skip to the donuts. <laughs> Get to the good part. Bless you. Thank you. The perfect place to sneeze. Um, yeah, so what's... There's a lot. Um, trying to explain... The Holy Spirit um, is, again, one of those <coughs> numberless tasks that is presented to me to try to clarify things that are impossible to bring clarity to. Again, um, yeah, it is an envi enviable position that I find myself in because I'm sure you all wish you could be doing this, explaining this idea of the Holy Spirit. Uh, further complicating it is that we are not, uh, as a denomination, people that are super spirit-focused or centered. We really love us and Jesus, rightfully so. We love the Father, but we don't quite understand the Father. The Holy Spirit, well, it's there, but eh. what to do with the Spirit? Initially, I was trying to approach this from a very human perspective of, of thinking of the Spirit as the power of God and how do we tap into that Spirit? Wouldn't you all like the infinite power of God that, that the Scriptures tell us resides in us to be able to use that power? I mean, I certainly would love to have that power on the freeways. <laughs> Smiting people would be just... Wow, that would be awesome. I mean, after all, it is, it is the power present at creation. It, it's the same power that, that filled uh, the Old Testament uh, icons that accomplished and did amazing things. It was the parting of the Red Sea and the destruction of armies that were enormously greater and well, more well equipped than the Israelites ever could have been. It is all of those things and more. It is the power that rose Christ from the dead. I want that power. I'm a bit power hungry for it. Um, here's the problem. It's not our power. 
It's not. And how foolish would God be to give us access to that kind of thing? I mean, honestly, God's not that stupid. Um, however, from again, a very human perspective, I want that power. I want to tap into it. But it's not... It's not that kind of power for us to be used for our own benefit. Um, it is far more, I guess, theological than anything else. It's not so much what is the Holy Spirit or who is the Holy Spirit, in spite of the fact that in our trans translation of the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit is referred to with the male pronouns. The Spirit doesn't have a gender. Spirit doesn't have form or shape, much like God the Father does not, though I'm sure for all of us the imagery we have of the Father is the old, white, gray-haired, long-bearded dude sitting, grandfatherly figure sitting somewhere on a throne or with his arms outstretched or something. That is the creation of humans, not the actual form of God. Jesus makes it complicated because we've also seen pictures of the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Christ that is nothing like what Jesus looked like. Nevertheless, we, we have that imagery because he did take human form. And so it's easy for us to cast that image upon him. But the Spirit is not a who or a what. So what is the Spirit? Well, it's not a what. How do I explain the Spirit? And I think, well, Jesus, if you were listening to that gospel and, and you thought about it, which you didn't have much time to do because I went right into the sermon right after the reading. So um, it's a lot of things. It is a promise. Spirit is that gift, that thing that Jesus promised that he would leave behind for us. Why? Because he wasn't going to be with us any longer. The incarnation and the three years that Jesus spent doing his public ministry were not going to be duplicated. And they were the most impactful thing that has ever happened in the history of creation by a long stretch. I mean, nothing even comes close to second place of something that impacted our world. Uh, participate and join in our Bible study if you want to hear more about that. And for Jesus to no longer be with us, what was going to be left? Well, it's not just about the physical presence of Christ. Again, it's more about what God did through the incarnation and what changed in our world. What did Jesus proclaim when he came? He didn't proclaim, I'm the Savior, I'm taking away your sins. Uh, forgiveness is going to come by faith. He came to proclaim the kingdom of God. He came to proclaim God's breaking into our world. One of countless, again, concepts that are impossible to explain. But what further complicates, is, complicates it is the fact that what Jesus, what that inaugurated, what that marked in our world, of God stepping into our world has not yet been completed. We are in process. We are like a margarita that's been put in a blender. The potential for deliciousness is there, but until that blender is turned off and you pour it in a salt-rimmed glass and squeeze a lime in it, I don't know why I'm using that analogy. <laughs> Holy Spirit, there you go. Um, you're just left with the mouth-watering thought of what you're going to be taking in as soon as you take that lid off and pour it in that glass. It's not done yet, but it's in process. The language of the end times is prominent in the scriptures, Old and New Testament. The writers of scripture and Christ himself, that was always sort of in the background, sometimes in the foreground, of what he is speaking about and what was being spoken about. 
Uh, it was in the prophet Joel. Uh, it was in what Paul wrote. It was, it's often in how Jesus speaks. He said he was going to leave the Spirit and, and going to give that to us, but it hadn't yet happened. It is always in a process, and we want to get to the end. We want everything to be finished. How many of you have the kind of patience to wait for, I don't know, thousands of years for something to take place, let alone five minutes? We become increasingly more impatient in our world. We want the end to come. But that's not up to us. We don't have control over that. And part of what this Holy Spirit is, it's, it is promise. Um, it is also the active presence of what God is doing. Just as Jesus was physically present and actively doing things to witness to the presence of the kingdom of God, that there is healing that there is inclusiveness, that there is salvation and eternal life, that there is a way of selflessness, of care and concern for the least among us, because Jesus often spoke of that, that we can detach ourselves from the worldly things, our possessions, our finances, our security. We can let go of the idols that we have created in our world because all has been secured for us by what Christ did on the cross. We know the future. We know how the story ends. We know because of the promise that our sins are forgiven. And so the things that we strive for to bring us security and to bring us hope that are temporal, that are things that Jesus said will deteriorate through rust, that we can let go of those things and trust in the promises of God. And so the Spirit is the thing that gives us that hope. And it's a hope for things that we can't see. It's a hope for things that we can't grasp. It is a hope that lives and resides in our hearts. It's the presence of God, not just in us, but in our world. Prior to Christ, God did interact with humankind. Oftentimes, it was terrifying. <laughs> Fall to your face, nose in the dirt. Please stop because I'm shaking in my boots. God, you are too awesome. And it was done with evidence and, well, portents, as the scriptures say, of great and mighty and powerful things like seas parting and like thunderclouds and billowing smoke and so many other things, the earth opening up to swallow people up. But the way that the Old Testament people perceived was that God would just show up every once in a while and wasn't always present with them, though God has always been present and active in our world. And then for three years of 33, we think, was very active, physically present, doing things again in fulfillment of the promises that the prophets of old had spoke. But if he leaves, what evidence do we have? We have a promise. Jesus said it was so. Is that not enough? Do we need more than a promise from the creator of heaven and earth to know that it is true, that he is present with us because the gods of old, the pagan gods, didn't care enough about this world or people in it to be present and active. Our God is present and active. Our God does care enough to be present.
present and active constantly. The omnis of God, of omniscient and omnipresent, being all-powerful and caring enough to be involved in the things that we're doing. Not involved enough that we can call on that power of God and make Him do the things we want Him to do. No, I still crave that power. Please, Lord. I would like that power. We are the created, not the creator. We are not granted that privilege. But because of the promise, and because of the spirit of God, the activity of God, the wisdom of God, the truth of the gospel, the power in the gospel made real by the Spirit, we, the people that have come 2,000 years after Christ walked this earth, have come to believe in that very truth that they all witnessed. Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians. Again, magnificent book. Having so much fun in our Bible study with that. When the people of Corinth are questioning or just acting the fool and wondering about this spirituality, and it's something that they craved, the power of it as well, they wanted, and they thought that Paul was holding back on them, and they had started claiming their own, their salvation as something that they had earned or deserved, or somehow gained knowledge over it, and Paul says, no, you fools, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit of God that has given you this faith, how do I know that? Because you are the least among these people, you are the poor and the wretched. You are of nothing. Nobody respects or admires you. You are the 99%. And God chose you to be his people. Who else would do that? What more proof do you need that there is the Spirit of God active in our world and present with us than the fact that he has chosen you and given you this faith? Not so that you could use it for your own benefit, but so that you would know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God loves you. But that also, as Jesus said, to allow us to carry on, to allow us to proclaim the power of the gospel, the power of God that is in Christ crucified. The only way that we have come to believe is because of the word spoken, the truth of the gospel being proclaimed in word and deed, and the spirit that lives in that that allows us to believe. Jesus has not walked among us for 2,000 years, and yet billions of people have come to know that truth, the very truth that we cling to as our hope. It's not because of our eloquent words. It's not because it makes sense. <laughs> it doesn't. It is as nonsensical as anything that you can think of, of a God who would become human and die on a cross, and the rest of it. It's not because of that. It's because of the power of the Holy Spirit. To do what God has always been doing is to redeem and to restore and to save and to break chains and to bring to light a love that is extravagant and infinite. That the God of creation cares enough about us to do what Jesus did. And for that truth to not be planted deeply and firmly in our brains, but in our hearts. In a way that I hope all of you have a confidence in the power of that truth. Because it doesn't make sense always up here. But in here, there rests something stirring in our hearts that tells us this truth. That's the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. It's not a cloud, it's not a tongue of fire, it's not a who or a what. It's 
It's the power of God to save and the fact that we can believe that through faith. This is the ongoing gift. You don't get to tap into that power. You simply benefit from it because God chooses to allow that. God gives us that gift that we can live in hope and live in peace with one another and live in a way that reflects the kingdom of heaven in our world, the transformative power of the gospel in a way that others can see so that a thousand years from now or a hundred or two hundred or five thousand years from now, more and more people will have come to believe. just inconceivable, absolutely remarkable. One of my old professors used to say, stunning, and he would lift up his feet. Stunning. <laughs> it can't be explained, friends. I, I don't have the answer for you. But I know you all understand it enough to know of God's love and the saving power of Christ. This is the celebration of the day of Pentecost. This is the celebration for us to know that as we have come to faith, God has given us that spirit to believe against all odds and against evidence that points in something to a different reality, that the kingdom of heaven is here. Hallelujah.